to currently stand for and in honor of the national anthem. <laughs> Thank you. Without, without further ado, may I request Professor V. K. Jensa, Vice Chancellor, Tezpur University, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Angel CM. His Excellency, the Chancellor of Tejpur University and Governor of the State of Assam, Professor Jagdish Mukhi, our esteemed keynote speakers, Professor Manjul Hazarika, the Director, GIC Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Professor Virendra Kumar Vijay, the National coordinator of Unnat Bharat Abhyan and a professor at IIT Delhi. My own colleagues, Professor D.C. Barua, the director internal quality assurance cell and head of the department uh, of energy. Professor Joya Chakravarti, head of the department of mass comm and journalism. Uh, my colleague in the administration, Dr. Biren Das, and all the participants from abroad and India. On behalf of Tejpur University and on my personal behalf, it's such a privilege and honor to welcome you all on the occasion of this webinar, uh, the Sustainable Technologies and Rural Development, a Kandian Perspective which is being jointly organized, as has been mentioned, by AIT Bangkok and Tejpur University 
which is uh, located in northeastern part of India and is one of the most premier institutions in the field of higher education in the country. As some of you may be familiar with Gandhi's principles and some facets of his life's journey, uh, all of you would attest to the fact that Gandhi was an extraordinary human being. The famous scientist Albert Einstein had once remarked, and I quote, generations to come will scarcely believe such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. Gandhi was a common aspiring young Indian barrister who got uh, his law degree from England and who later transformed to a formidable crusader for fighting racial discrimination, injustices, and oppressive colonial rule, not only in South Africa and India, but also gave inspiration to many world leaders who were also fighting against, against the uh, racial discrimination and the colonial uh, rule. People lovingly gave uh, Gandhi for all his contributions, uh, the noble title of Mahatma. In fact, some of you uh, might have read a bit about Gandhi's life, uh, and I have uh, read the, his autobiography, and that's where uh, it is mentioned that Gandhi did whatever he did and all he could. Uh, it's all because of his moral strength, which he derived from uh, spirituality. Uh, and uh, as uh, now the world knows that he was well ahead of his times as far as the kind of principles and the kind of values he believed in. Uh, in fact, these uh, cardinal principles which he, he propagated, his views had a huge impact, not only on the, on the history of some of the countries in the previous century, but those principles and values are still relevant today in present times and would continue to be relevant in future uh, too if we have to address some of the pressing challenges of the, of the uh, present century. Uh, Gandhi's, uh, Gandhi spoke on practically everything and gave views on uh, all aspects of our lives. But his cardinal and unshakable faith in nonviolence, compassion for all, peace and justice, and his views on role of science in progress of humanity, good governance, development, environment, empowerment of people, and life of dignity for all are so, so relevant uh, in the present day context. In fact, if you look at some of the uh, sustainable development goals, the goal one, goal two, goal six, uh, uh, majority of these goals, no poverty, zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, good health and well-being, responsible consumption, uh, strong institutions, and the concept of sustainable development itself. In fact, you would find a resonance with his thoughts and principles. Our world, especially the rural areas, which account for nearly 60% of the world's population, and mainly those in South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America uh, 
you know, uh, the areas which are crying out for uh, meaningful development, a development which is in harmony with nature, which is sustainable. I think Gandhian philosophy is, is, is so uh, crucial to follow. Um, so with these words, uh, I welcome you once again and look forward to the address of our Honorable Governor, who is also uh, who also has been a academician uh, uh, in Delhi University, uh, and I look forward to the uh, the uh, addresses of other keynote speakers. Um, I now humbly request uh, Honorable Governor Professor Jagdish Mukhi to inaugurate the webinar. Thank you. Mashkar. Esteemed panelists, participants, and viewers, I hope you all are doing well. Gandhian perspective of uh, suitable technologies and rural development, in order to understand this topic, one needs to understand the locus and focus of Gandhian philosophy. Let me first deal with the locus uh, that is context. Hence, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the father of the nation, had his uh, grooming in South Africa and soon after his return to India, like Vivekanand, undertook a national tour to personally see, experience and understand the real India. This Pan India tour made him realize the nature of Indian subcontinent, its rural and agrarian bushy economy, its unique set of uh, social systems and economic functions. These unique aspects uh, and initial experiences created a lasting impression and formed the foundation for further evolution of Gandhian politic socio-economic vision for India. Gandhiji's principles of uh, Satyagraha, Ahinsa and Abhay formed the crux of uh, Gandhian philosophy. Gandhiji observed that while the colonial superpowers and other Western countries have progressed with the Industrial Revolution, India was largely an agro-weaving rural economy with very little industrial growth. About 90% of the then population of our country was rural and agrarian. In such a scenario, with a colonial government that wanted our country to remain a market, Gandhiji realized that industrialization would not start in the near future unless India attains independence from colonial rule. Gandhiji also thought of a model consistent with the political, economic and social context of the time to engineer the emergence of our country from the cloud of that prevailing time. Let me quickly touch upon these three contexts that is political, economic and social. First, political reality of the time was India was a colony, not just a colony, but fragmented into British India and nearly 556 princely states in very diffuse manner. Second, economically India remained in the pre-industrial era and was an exploited colony of the colonial power, providing raw materials and cheap labor at low cost, and instead was burdened to be the market of the processed and industrially value added goods from industrially advanced colonial powers. Third, sociologically, India was a very traditional with various ethnic diversities that also created distinction in the name of caste, breed, language, and religion, among others. In such a complex scenario, Mahatma Gandhi realized that the greatest need for India was 
scratch, which alone can usher the paradigm shift in the country's socio-political economic independence. This was amongst the core locus or context of Ghanaian philosophy. Friends, Gandhiji constructed his socio-political economic philosophy as an integrated concept and not an isolated one. Satyagraha, Ahinsa and Abhay were seen as the core and absolute moral foundation upon which the Gandhian superstructure was constructed. Gandhiji realized that to attain Swaraj based upon the core principle of Satyagraha, Ahinsa or Abhay, an anti-colonial integrated alternative is to be constructed. With that objective, we evolved the concept of Gram Swaraj. Though Gandhiji was deeply religious and devoted to Lord Rama at the personal level, his concept of uh, Rama Raj is to be seen not as a religious principle but as a lofty moral ideal ingrained on tenets of welfare of all. Gandhiji realized that in order to realize Swaraj, we need to be independent of products of colonial masters, which have made us neo slaves, consumerism, and this slavery will perpetuate the tyranny. To overcome this, he popularized Gram Swaraj, where the traditional village economy of the rural India could thrive in autonomous manner by becoming self-dependent. He thought that if uh, villages uh, which formed the bulk of the deed in India became self-dependent, the parasitic model of uh, deprivation of India would stop. Also, he believed that the countrymen would then become not only economically free, but socially empowered to answer the high moral call be ready for any sacrifice, become fearless of the colonial power, and become united to fight for and realize Swaraj. Gandhiji realized that the might of the colonial power cannot be challenged with arms as the very murmur of a protest would be suppressed by colonial power with the brute force. Also, the moral strength of countrymen their fear of the colonial power, their divisions along various fault lines need to be addressed. A mere social, political or economic movement will fail to sustain in the scenario that prevailed in India at that time. Unless the moral, emotional cord of masses was touched, any movement for political, economic, social freedom would not be possible. Thus, Gram Suraj became the bedrock of his uh, political and economic approach. Sustainable technology and rural development are subsets of Gandhian concept of uh, Gram Suraj. Traditional Indian rural economy perhaps uh, led the virtues of industrialization, but uh, never led to creativity, innovation and adoption. Every village was unique in the way implements were designed, used and improved. This is an indicator of rural technological development and innovation. Also the villages with their comprehensive components of skilled tradesmen and artisans ensured a level of self-dependence and autonomy. Gandhiji felt that this uh, economic model of Gram Swaraj, wedded with the Satyagraha, Ahinsa and Abhaya, under the objective of realizing the spirit of Ram Raj, would help achieve Rashtriya Swaraj. Gandhiji favored sustainable development as a natural corollary to the Ram Raj, or for that matter, Gram Swaraj. Non-industrial rural economy prevailing at the time in India was not uh, exploitative but uh, integrative and tuned to nature and available nature, 
natural resources. Consumerism was very limited. Monetization of economy was very meager. In such a scenario, there was a limited exploitation of nature. Caravans of uh, traders or sea trade was in its uh, infancy and not comparable to present scenario. Industrialization of uh, West was denied to colonially subjugated India, which was seen as a market and politically and economically dependent uh, territory. Gandhiji, who had traveled the West and seen the exploitation in Africa, developed an alternative model. Sustainability was given in his concept of Gram Swaraj based on rural development model. Friends, Gandhian philosophy is very practical and relevant in the current context also. Considering the fact that India is a largely agrarian, the core concepts of self-sustainability and comprehensive rural development are the key approaches to national socio-economic development. In the prevailing situation, when we are fighting hard against COVID-19, Aap Nirbhar Bharat, launched by Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, is very much a Gandhian economic approach focusing on self-dependency and autonomy. It's a well-accepted proposition that only a nation that is strong and self-dependent in core sectors of the economy will stand tall and self-assured in the community of nations. Dear friends, I would like to conclude with warm wishes to the organizers to have organized such a thoughtful, provoking webinar and invited me to inaugurate the same. I have shared the locus and focus of Gandhian philosophy, including the issues pertaining to the topic. It is uh, the 150th birth anniversary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi ji, a legend whom future generations find amazed to believe as having lived in our midst uh, in flesh and blood. Let's uh, follow footsteps of this uh, greatest of human being. Jai. Thank you so much, sir, for reminding us of our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and his contribution not just to India, but to society as a whole, which we continue to take benefit of even today. We are honored to have you join us today, sir, to inaugurate today's program. May I now request Professor D.C. Borua, Coordinator, Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, Tezpur University, for the introductory note highlighting activities of organizing institutes relevant to the theme. Sir. Thank you, Your Excellency, Professor Rajesh Mukhi, Chancellor of Tezpur University and Governor of Assam, my esteemed Vice Chancellor, Professor V.K. Jain, all our esteemed speakers, Professor Birendra Kumar Bijay, Dr. Manjil Kumar Hazarika, Madam Sakrabhujaya Sakrabhati, all my colleagues, and all the participants reaching around 1500 from India, Ireland, South Africa, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. I have told that the stations have come from these areas also. I am very happy to give the little background about this particular webinar, two honorable speakers have already highlighted the perspective of Gandhi's relevance of the Gandhian thought in today's context of higher academic institutes, as well as the context of economic context, the social context, the political context that was required at the time, and the present day relevance, including the Atman version, Atman Yuval Bharat, and the present crisis caused by the COVID. I am tempted to tell you about the Tesco University's humble initiative and about as the mandate of the sustainable technology, sustainable development, to inculcate among the learners that we are doing 
by providing defined curriculum, defined component of the sustainability in its curriculum, also in different practices. For example, the green campus, little green campus that we have in the rural background in this northeastern corner as our northern facility as an elevator, we are recycling the nutrients of the fallen leaves. We are not allowing to waste the leaves and thereby we are reducing the consumption of the chemical fertilizer. This has been a practice since its inception and we are really proud to be a part of it. Our learners are getting benefit to learn it. This is only one of the many our initiatives. The solar power as one of the renewable energy sources is our now major contributions of this support of this energy. This is another example that sustainable way of doing. We also are doing the, as we are surrounded by different uh, only the rural areas, the understanding, the integrating the rural thoughts, rural issues among the curriculum to understand train our students has been also our, in our agenda. In recent time, we have benefited by the UBA in the Bharat Vision Program. Five of the villages, nearby villages, located uh, among our, uh, in this place to Sunitpur district of Assam, which around 1,300, uh, 13,000 uh, 13, population and around 3,000 households have been considered for this UBA program. And we are benefited to take it as an as if it's a laboratory for us to show the path of sustainable development. And in this context, we understood the technology, the modern day advanced technology has also a role. Professor Vinda Kumar Bita, who has um, really from the Christian University community, we are thankful to you all, agreeing to address this webinar by which we understand the relevance of the Gandhian thought that part and then UBA program and how higher education institutes would this UBA program would help us to strengthen our academic programs as well as to deliver as per the expectation of the society, expectation of the government, this UBA program. So that way, you talk, we are, all of us are evaluating for this UBA integration of these higher education institutes and then sustainable technologies, how rural development could be achieved. Dr. Manjul Kumar Hazarika, who has worked on this particularly use specific techniques and its applications for rural development, for agricultural development. We are benefited by some of this information, some of the resources that understanding among the Indian villages. Gandhi's philosophy of truth, truth is okay, but if we uh, convert the unknown truth to known truth by the technology, for example, the special image by uh, the satellite image, that will benefit the rural mass. The conversion of the unknown truth to uh, known truth, that conversion is possible by this technology, special technology. This is only one example. I am sure that uh, Manjil Kumar Hazarika will also elaborate the tools and technologies that could be modern day tools and technologies that could be used for sustainable development. Communication has been taught another tools or another area that requires because knowledge about the schemes, the government schemes, running how it effectively runs in the rural areas, the communication, the communication at the right time is also another area, another issue. If it delays, then the due benefit or the if justice is not prevailed. So Madam Sakazar Sakarabati will tell us about the role of communication, how we could think of the modern day tools and technologies and communication linkages for rural development. Thereby, all these two speakers are evaluating, we welcome you, Shai. Definitely, uh, with these two speakers that will be spoken, our esteemed chancellor, as well as vice chancellor, and you two talks will help us, help our learners, help our sister university community, in particular and in general, and their academic fraternity. I welcome all of you, sir, and I'm evaluating uh, 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 along with my colleagues. UBA team, we have 10 core faculty members supported by entire university community to do this in work. This particular event will also be benefited with the UBA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for highlighting the theme of today's webinar and also the efforts of this for university in contributing to sustainable development. Now, with the permission of His Excellency Chancellor of this University and Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, may we begin with the technical sessions?
We will now begin with the technical sessions. Before we begin, I would like to make an announcement to all the resource persons that the questions and comments will be taken at the end of the entire program. Our first speaker for today, Dr. Manzul Kumar Hazarika, is currently the director of the Geoinformatics Center, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. Over the past several years, Dr. Hazarika has been extensively working in applications of geospatial technologies in agriculture, disaster management, and environment using state-of-the-art technologies such as high-resolution imaging, big data, machine learning, etc. He worked in more than 20 countries in the Asia-Pacific as well as the Caribbean regions to support the government in planning and decision-making by integrating geospatial technologies with conventional data, methods, and tools. He, at present, actively involved in developing a cloud-based disaster risk assessment platform in open source environments in collaborations with ITC Netherlands. He is also currently working with the FAO in estimating damages caused to crops by disasters, especially floods. He has also published several research articles and applications of remote sensing and GIS in disaster management and related topics. Today, Sir will be sharing with us his expert opinion on sustainable technology and Gandhian perspective of rural development. Dr. Mandal Kumar Hazarika, sir. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer. Uh, Professor Devin Sandra for inviting me for this uh, very special uh, seminar. I am really privileged to be a part of it. I would like to uh, first the Chancellor of Titasper University, uh, Professor Zagdis Mukhi, and also Governor of Hassam, Professor VK Jain, Vice Chancellor of Titasper University. Uh, my <clears throat> their faculty colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. So I will be talking about uh, uh, the, my topic will be advances in geoinformatics for agriculture and rural development. Let me share my uh, slides. Uh, Can you see my slides? Professor yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So the, let me put it in uh, presentation mode sometimes. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> uh, when I was requested to talk about uh, uh, this uh, backdrop of this particular webinar, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. So I thought that agriculture and rural development would be the best uh, uh, area where I should talk about. Where we are using uh, new technologies for the development of the uh, society, particularly in the rural society. So uh, this my topic, uh, contents of my presentation, I'll give an introduction. I'll go for to set how satellite data is using for crop monitoring and yield forecasting. And I'll then go to the latest technology drones for crop monitoring and yield forecasting. Then I'll also talk about a little bit of application of big data in agriculture. Then also application of geoinformatics for agroecological uh, zoning and crop suitability mapping. And also geoinformatics for rural development, I'll give you a few examples. So first of all, uh, <clears throat> there is an increasing role of data in smart farming. And you can uh, see that uh, there are few, uh, a few important aspects is like uh, smart sensing and monitoring. Then you have smart analysis and planning and also smart control of farm operations. So all these things put together in a cloud-based environment and data management, which can enable you to very, uh, 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 to manage your farm in an uh, 
advanced manner so that you get the good yield as well as you can manage your crops and asset uh, efficiently. So, uh, for uh, whatever the case, data acquisition is the data is the most important uh, aspect of uh, agricultural management, and uh, for to do that, we can do have satellite, which is around seven to eight hundred kilometer up there. We have aeroplane, few kilometers. Uh, then we have drone, maybe within uh, five hundred meter or. Or more, or then also we have at the bottom ground survey. So far, we were people. We have we are getting data, ground survey and satellite. This uh, aeroplane also being used for some time, but it's quite expensive. But recent invent of drones, this data collection become very easy and uh, also uh, cost effective because the uh, quality of data you. Uh, acquire from drone is very good and if you get it either by aeroplane or for high region satellite it is very very expensive. So this is one of the new emerging area in data collection uh, uh, in, in coming days. So data acquisition platforms, uh, I will give you the broad example quickly. Satellite is a uh, extensive cover, huge area, several even hundreds of kilometers can be covered. <clears throat> it has a lot of uh, spectral cameras, different kind of camera in one satellite. But problem is it's expensive and relatively low resolution. I mean, the commercially available satellite data would be around 30 centimeter uh, per, per pixel. And data acquisition is uh, uh, on, um, you have to wait uh, satellite to come to a particular place, so weekly, bi-weekly. In some cases, maybe daily. Uh, aircraft is uh, also high resolution, um, uh, uh, large single flight, large area can be covered, but it's very expensive. So, and also susceptible to weather. If you have cloud or rain, you probably cannot, uh, uh, you are not advisable to fly the airplane. Drones, uh, on the other hand, you can go up to one to two centimeter resolution, unaffected by cloud cover because it's fly below cloud, cost effective. And image on demand, whenever you like, you just fly the drone by yourself. And But problem is relatively small coverage. And one of the biggest problem, even in India today, is the regulation. Um, practically, I mean, uh, theoretically, you cannot fly any drone in India as of today. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, I think the government is bringing the new legislation, which will be immediate or quickly. Uh, operation and serving of course it is very high quality high resolution but problem is it's slow tedious and labor intensive difficult to record uh, top of the uh, field such like a building or tree and also many of the inaccessible area serving is very very difficult now <clears throat> I'll talk about crop monitoring and in forecasting in satellite data uh, uh, as you know uh, the sunlight comes and it uh, absorbed by the trees and then um, it is reflected apart. The amount of energy um, uh, absorbed by the trees, uh, green leaves, which basically uh, photosynthesis and uh, produce the uh, crop or fruit or whatever. Now, these, uh, if you look at the green ones, so the amount of energy absorbed is very, very high and only very small part of energy is released. So, and on the other hand, if it is non-green, then more energy is released. So this principle is used in remote sensing to uh, define a index called normalized difference visitation index NDVI. So more NDVI means your tree uh, is healthy condition, very green. More green, more NDVI. So this is the principle we use in remote sensing to see the crop health basically. So this is uh, in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we did a World Bank project, I think, 2013, and you can see these dark blue colors. These are the very high, healthy uh, rice crops, uh, very green crop. And then what we do is that we develop some uh, yield model for a certain location, and then we look at the 
because this data is available in 250 meter resolution from 2001. Every day, every 10 days, this data is available, eight to 10 days. And then we look at the 2000 data, what is the NDVR greenness a particular location, what is the yield in 2001. Similarly, and every year we do, and we get a kind of regression and all, uh, model, and then you can predict the yield. This is what it is. So you can see 2001 to this actual prediction was 198 uh, and 200, uh, uh, 1,98,290 uh, tons. Then predicted was is 170, 177,547. So uh, this is actual and predict there is. Of course, there are some differences there, but the advantage of this prediction is that you can predict before harvesting. But this actual one, it takes at least six to eight months because agriculture department take the crop samples, they call crop cutting experience, entire state, they have to bring the data, statistical analysis, analyze. so it takes six to eight months. So if you can predict if just before uh, or during the time of harvesting, the farmer can decide uh, that if the government can tell farmer that if there's a, you can say whether it's overproduction or there's a deficiency in production, this can be done six months ahead. And at that point in time, when harvesting is occurring, happening, price in the market is less because there are new products are coming. But if you know that there is a less in production in your state, Maybe government can take advanced measure at that point of time to buy these crops in advance at a cheap rate. Or maybe they know that there are a lot of production, they can plan for the uh, uh, exporting their products. So this is one of the examples and uh, we, we, we did in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, this is for also we can, because I said every 8 to 10 days you know the greenness. So you can also know which rice was grown early. The yellow one is um, in May, blue one in June, and July one is uh, uh, the last uh, showing of the rice. And also you can see the crop intensity, how many crops you normally took, um, uh, one, the red one is one crop, single crop, blue is two crops, oh, sorry, green is uh, two crops, and blue is three crops, very small, small spots only, because they are pretty predominantly, there is no third crop in, in this uh, state. Uh, my friend, uh, Professor Borua, helped me to get some data from Sundipur and Udalguri. And you can see uh, that uh, actual data, and we predicted before harvesting, pretty close actually, without going to field, just sitting in Bangkok, we did this one. So it is quite interesting. If you do some field work, it will be improved certainly. And we have some more plan to work with Taspur, Professor Borua and Taspur on, on this in coming months. This is in Bangladesh, very close, we did. This is in Cambodia. So similar thing we did using drones. So we, you can see three types of drones. Uh, one is multi-rotor, upper right, then left one is fixed wing, and below right third is a hybrid. Because this first one, top one, right side, it is a multi-rotor. Uh, it can uh, fly like a helicopter. It can stop in the air, no problem. Uh, but it is only you fly for 20 minutes to 25 minutes only. The left one, uh, aeroplane fixed wing, this is long range. It can go to uh, even up to 100 kilometer. Uh, but problem is it is, uh, uh, you need uh, some landing space and uh, uh, and also payload is a small payload. You cannot put a big payload there. So, to take advantage of this time and uh, and long flying, we developed this third one in a down. It's called uh, VTOL, vertical uh, takeoff and landing. So all these three drones, what you are seeing, is built by us here in our center here in AIT, and we have been using now in various applications in Thailand, and we have planned to uh, also do some in India and other countries. So uh, this is uh, uh, the different camera you use, use. This right one is, you see red one, there are five cameras. So this is useful for uh, knowing the greenness is called, uh, because of several cameras. So we, NDVI greenness you can get. So you can see using, using these drones, you can see that 
if there is a crop, if there are pests attack, where you can see uh, uh, some of this area or some problem, uh, you can easily detect using this kind of data. This is also some invasive uh, uh, species of uh, wheat and uh, or other things uh, in a cropland. You can very easily identify in this kind of data, very high high resolution, high quality data. You can see the oil oil palm uh, plantations. Uh, you can see because oil palm is several meters high. You cannot uh, know what is uh, the uh, quality or if uh, the tree is because you have to see from below. But if you fly from up, you can really see the the uh, condition of the crop. On the right hand side, you can also uh, count the tree, uh, how many trees you are there, and if uh, some trees are problematic, you can. If they are not going doing well, you can you can think of replacing using uh, and you uh, identify the exact location of the tree. So this is also plan counting. So you can see all the trees. You can see some gaps here and there, and those gaps you can you know where to gaps are there, and you need replanting. Or some trees are uh, weak uh, or some problem, then you can think of replacing. But this is a quite advantageous. Um, way because farmers, as I said, they cannot see from uh, the top, so it's very difficult for them to, uh, to take this kind of decision. But drones make it very, very easy. Uh, biomass saturation is one of the uh, biggest uh, problem, and I am working with uh, Tespo University now to estimate the biomass uh, in various parts of Assam uh, using satellite data to see the how much energy, bioenergy, we can get in Assam. So this is uh, this technology will help very much because you also know the height of the tree using this kind of data. So uh, then you can est better estimate this uh, biomass. So this rise, what I have done in Uttar, uh, Uttar Pradesh, we also did some experiment uh, in the plot in here in Thailand using, using rice. These are the 16 experimental plots with different inputs of um, uh, water and fertilizer. And uh, as you say, the from uh, transplantation stage, it, uh, greenness increases, and you, you monitor that. One. So uh, this is the rice uh, field actually, and uh, you can see the some of the areas uh, plots did not do well for some reasons. So we can identify easily. Then also we get the NDVI greenness. Uh, so these are the uh, dark area, brown uh, high greenness. Then also, uh, um, we also look at the different stages of the planting and we fly the drone according to, to capture those stages of rice. And then we plot the yield and it's very similar to what we have seen in satellite data. So your uh, yield and uh, NDVI is uh, very close. Related. The right side is NDR, but it's a, uh, very close to NDVI. It's just almost same thing, uh, but the, uh, since we have several cameras in our in our sensor, in our uh, equipment. So we try to uh, take two type of data, basically, but it's basically the same thing. So agroecological uh, donation. So uh, this is very important because you see the, um, uh, our, for example, you know, Haryana Punjab is doing a lot of nice uh, cultivation, but actually uh, it is not suitable for, for rice because you need so much water for rice and they don't have uh, that much of uh, rainfall. So uh, because of that, uh, there is a groundwater depleting in Haryana, Punjab, uh, and this is causing a huge problem in future. So what kind of crop you need to uh, suitable for your land? It's a crop uh, uh, ecological donation developed by FU. They started in 1978. Till now, they had a lot of development, but problem was the, it was not in public domain or open source. So FU came to us and asked us to um, do it uh, in CIS or, or, uh, so that it can be used by anybody and also open source. And we did this one uh, last year. And now we are implementing this one in Laos and Afghanistan. So basically, you see, you need to, uh, to look at the uh, need a crop suitability. You need climate data, soil data, 
terrain means elevation data and crop parameters and you can look at the crop yield and crop suitability both. So basically this is Laos we did, you see the whole country we developed into some grid or, or, or squares. That the square size you can define depending on your data availability. So you can look at this rod, red dot where from January 1 we know the we know the, the climate data or weather data on January 1st from Everest data for long term Everest or soil information we have, we have elevation information, we have all crop parameters for say you take 10 crops and you have the parameters of this all 10 crops with you. Then on that particular day, you start simulating these 10 crops. And then uh, 365 days, you you try to, depending on your crop, uh, crop calendar, you put different crops and you simulate that. At the end um, uh, of your uh, crop growing season, you can calculate the crop uh, biomass, uh, crop yield, um, if there, there's an effect of water limitation, or there's an effect of soil, terrain, other things, all these things can be monitored. Now, out of 10, which will be performing best for that particular location? So you put that crop or that uh, parts of part, three, four crops uh, during the whole, uh, there were 365 days. So you can uh, find the best suitable crop data. So this is what we, we did in Laos. You can see the crop suitability map, uh, estimated yield, land class suitability, right hand side. You can multi crop uh, for for your, in Laos, which are the area you have. Uh, you can uh, you can you can uh, grow multi crops uh, because of water limitation and other climatic uh, constraints. So we did some validation. This blue one is our. It is, we also calculate evaporator using this model, uh, this our model. So you see the our blue one and this rice, uh, right two ones are the, some uh, from the literature. It's very up to the second decimal, uh, first decimal is accurate. So we are very, very confident that uh, it is working very well. Our model, now we are going to implement, we start implementing in Afghanistan. Uh, but the uh, advantage is that it's all digital, so we can, once we get that up uh, sitting here, without going to Afghanistan, we can still do this. So also we did the uh, estimated deal. Uh, in, uh, some, you see, estimated to us 2.72 tons per hectare, reference yield of 7 weeks, very, very accurate. And this information, this model, all free, all with us, will be very happy to share with you. And I believe that it will be a great advantage uh, for, for the countries or a state like Assam or anywhere uh, to, for the government to plan uh, their agriculture. So this is the future outlook of agriculture. Uh, as you know, uh, we, uh, FAO, I am also part of FAO, some of the committee, and they are promoting this, they call uh, future farm, small and smart. So a farmer is sitting here, he's a highly technocrat guy, I mean, technically, uh, not technical, guy, he's a technically AOR. He will fly drones, uh, he will have uh, the, uh, tractors, all uh, uh, remotely controlled, all. He has all this cow, uh, sensor is the, with the cow, he knows the location of the cow, what they are doing. Uh, then also, they have come a new, co a new uh, coin, a new term called agri, agri box means agricultural robot. So these are the, because a uh, few things uh, that unless you, uh, you, you mechanize or you make this uh, agriculture good like this, uh, people are not educated people or techno kids will go to this field. And um, uh, for example, if you look at a lot of uh, labor shortages in, in, in agriculture, sector like tea gardens you can see not many, nobody wants to do agriculture because they hard work and not much money but i think our youngsters so it's universities that's for university or other universities should i mean maybe train uh, to adopt this uh, this kind uh, of agriculture as their, their profession and uh, very high end agriculture and high quality products will be very good. I quickly uh, go through a little bit of rural development. Uh, this is actually the Bhuban platform of ISRO. Uh, today morning I look at that and I, you see, I 
this data is available every location. You see the Nopam here, your university is located, and there is a, some this green spot, and I click at the red, and I agree, one of the green it become red. It is a micro irrigation near your your university. You can see this kind of micro irrigation is happening there. There is a fishery near your university. This is some. Uh, fishery is happening and is reported under uh, this is I think under the rural development scheme uh, this farmer might have got, got some money to do this this is some again uh, near the river uh, towards the east of your university you can see some flood control structure and also some uh, uh, near your university again some land development is happening all by the Ministry of Rural Development Government of India uh, and is happening. So I think uh, that is what uh, I want to say. Thank you very much. I'll take questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us on advances in geoinformatics for agriculture and rural development, highlighting on the different data acquisition platforms. We are certain that your work in the field, sir, is and will continue to benefit us all. Thank you so much, sir. Our second speaker for today, Professor V.K. Vijay, National Coordinator, Unnad Bharat Abhiyan, and a professor at IIT Delhi. He is an acclaimed and internationally known professor in biogas and rural technologies. His concepts on linking higher educational institutes for village development and biogas purification and bottling technology were well adopted by Government of India and launched as programs by a concerned ministry in the government. Professor Vijay and his team developed the concept and vision of Unnan Bharat Abhiyan, Movement for Progressive India, which was adopted by MHRD Government of India in 2014. He got patent on biogas, small scale biogas upgradation technology, which has been licensed to seven industries and many Gaushalas in field areas. Professor Vijay is actively engaged in research and worked for more than 40 sponsored research and consultancy projects from India and abroad. We would have not found a better resource person to share his opinion on Unnan Bharat Abhiyan for fulfilling Gandhi's dream of rural development. Professor V.K. Vijay, sir. Thank you, Sam. First of all, I would like to congratulate Tejpur University for organizing such a important uh, and useful webinar for Indian participants, participants from Thailand, participants from South Africa, and from other global areas from where Indians are there, people are there, and who are thinking about Gandhian philosophy and thought for the holistic development and the human development. I am particularly thankful to the Chancellor and Governor of Assam, Professor Jagdish Mukherjee. He is a good friend of us. Also, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Vinod Jain, Tejpur Institute, Dr. Manju Lajarika from AIT Bangkok, Professor Joya Chakravarti, Professor Devendra Rajari Barua and other faculty members of the Puri University and other universities and colleges across the country. All the participants and participating institute of Punnat Bharat Abhiyan from all the states of this country, the students and their friends. The topic today that is sustainable technologies and rural development, the Gandhian perspective. If you remember, this year we are celebrating 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. And now we can understand after COVID-19 that his philosophy and thought is now more relevant for the whole country, for, for the whole world. That what we envisaged at that time in 1940s, 30s and even after independence, are so much relevant to the development of the global paradigm. 
he emphasizes that in india if mere independence is not sufficient unless we really get into the independence of our villages and in his seminal work of hind swaraj and gram swaraj which the honorable chancellor were mentioning the vision that unless our villages are developed unless all the people living in rural areas or urban areas are employed and they get good quality livelihood mere independence is not sufficient for this country and in that spirit he wanted that we should get ram rajya in this country it is not related to religion or it is not related to any political issue it means for ram rajya is that everybody should be happy every should body should achieve the goal of his life every should be everybody should get good quality employment sorry sir you're not audible hello yes sir you're audible now so since i'm not aware audible yes sir you're audible now sir have you listened to me earlier or not uh few seconds i am only see okay okay so i would like to because the topic of my today's speech is related unnat bharat abhiyan and how we are envisaging unnat bharat abhiyan as gandhian perspective to achieve in the country with the higher education institute in the country with the youth of this country and with the faculty members and teachers of the higher education institute so i have a small presentation which i would like to share with all of you and then in between i would like to discuss about uh, is it visible not yet sir not yet Is it visible now? No, sir. Sir, you give me the uh, yeah. Sir, you can click the present now option. In okay. The, in the bottom right corner. Yeah, I am present, making that present now. Yes, present now. Then choose okay. enter screen. Enter screen. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Then select. the screen and share then minimize the it's not working actually sir is it coming now yes sir yes yeah. sir it's coming yeah so you can just have a glance of the title of this that uh, this is a flexible program of ministry of education earlier this ministry was known as ministry of human resource development now it is known as ministry of education and the tagline of unnat bharat abhiyan is that shikshit bharat saksham bharat swasth bharat swalambhi bharat sampann bharat and now atmanirbhar bharat 
So how we can achieve the Gandhian dream of Gram Swaraj? Now this is in the vision of Unnat Bharat Abhyan also. And also the logo of Unnat Bharat Abhyan you can just visualize. It is the Gandhi's picture looking towards the horizon and sun rays. It means that the, we have to go a long way of achieving the Gram Swaraj through Unnat Bharat Abhyan in the country. So, the tagline which I just read it, Sikshit Bharat, Saksam Bharat, Swach Bharat, Swalambi Bharat, Sampanna Bharat, and how we can fulfill Gandhi's dream of Gram Swaraj, which is now attached with Unnat Bharat Abhyan, and this idea came to our mind for last 20-25 years in IIT Delhi. Many faculty members from our center, Center for Rural Development Technology and other departments, mechanical, electrical, civil, computer, deliberated long that how our education system in the country can be linked to our society, can be linked to our villages, still nearly 68% of population reside in villages. How many villages we are having? You may know that the number of villages in India is more than 6 lakhs. How many districts? We are having only 715 districts. How many cities? If you see the big cities, it is only 10 metros, you can say. 100 cities, you can say. Even you count the cities, towns, districts, headquarter or sub-district headquarter or talukas, it all numbers are nearly 4,000. So, 4,000 towns and cities in the country, whereas number of villages are 6 lakhs, more than 6 lakhs. It means still the spirit of India lies in villages and unless our villages are developed, unless our villages are empowered, Unless our villages are becoming self-reliant, we cannot think, think of becoming a developed nation, lead the whole world. And we were there during even 15th, 16th, 17th century. India was known as a Sone Ki Kiriya. And that's why the Britishers, the Francis, the Portuguese, the Dutch people, they came to India to do business with India, to earn money, to understand our economics. And at that time, till 17th century, India's share in the global economy was more than one third. India's share in the global economy was more than a third. And today, if we see, India's share in the global economy is nearly 1%. So where we were and today where we are. So why it happened and why were we at the top? Sony ki kiriya kyon the? Because our production system, our development system was based on decentralized system in villages. And that's why Gandhi ji understood the whole concept, the whole thing and the society and he promoted that unless our villages becomes the self land, we cannot achieve the real independence which India should. So looking to this, Gandhi is foreseen as in his, he has written in his seminal book, Hind Swaraj, the Western development paradigm. And after independence, instead of following the Gandhian principle, we followed the Western principles of development and Western development paradigm of US and Europe. And due to that, we are nothing. We haven't reached anywhere. And all our villages are now lagging behind. Our cities are polluted. And their resources are becoming very scarce in urban areas. 
everywhere you can see the lions in hospital in entertainment places in other markets so neither our cities nor our villages have developed in a way which it should have developed therefore based on centralized technologies and urbanization has given rise to serious problems like increasing inequity leading to crime and violence and climate change due to rapid ecological degradation this was envisaged by mahatma gandhi at that time in his hind swaraj and not only that there are huge development disconnects between the rural and urban sectors such as inequity in health education income and basic communities as well as employment opportunities all causing great discontent and large scale migration to urban areas thanks to covid-19 that after covid-19 people really understood that living in cities are not so easy with corona virus around and therefore millions of people more than 11 million people from urban areas men the big cities bombay delhi hyderabad madras bangalore they returned to their native place their villages on foot on cycle on well bullock cart or on thela or whatever vehicle whatever way they go they wanted to move back to their native villages and many of these people will not come back to urban areas now because they had seen that which they don't know what may happen after one year or two year and what may happen to their industries where they were working what may happen to the work which they were employing so it is better if they are able to get a quality livelihood in the village itself and also at the same time if someone is earning 100 rupees in a city and someone earning only 50 rupees in a village their status is equal they are able to maintain their livelihood at the same level 100 rupees equivalent to 50 rupees in villages so if our unnat bharat abhiyan our students our teachers our system can create good quality livelihood of these people in rural areas they will not migrate from rural areas to urban areas i envisage in india that by 2030 the reverse migration will start in the country because of the climate change employment and congestion and so many things in cities but this happened only in 2020 only due to the covid situation and now all over the globe all global development paradigms are changing so unnat bharat abhiyan is inspired by the vision of transformational change in rural development processes by leveraging knowledge institutions to help build the architecture of an inclusive india that is the beauty of this program that we are thinking of an inclusive india whether it's a rural or urban poor or rich has been the bridge for rural urban linkages and socio economic development has unnat bharat abhiyan is working for fulfilling gandhi's dream of rural development so gandhi ji was opinion that india should achieve gram swaraj which is equally important to independence and he pursued for it and given his vision of gram swaraj that how self reliant villages usually lo- using locally available resources because in villages all kind of resources are there primary productions are there which are not there in urban areas so if you go for primary production resources it is only available in rural areas it is not available in cities but they are cities urban people are exploiting rural areas so all the resources we are transporting it from rural areas to urban areas all the primary produce we are transporting from rural areas to urban areas and in turn 
the benefit is not going to the people who are really producing it but benefit is going to the middleman and marketing people and those who are selling it so the situation should change now as a matter of fact gandhi ji was not against mechanization as such he strongly objected to the craze of machinery generally people say that he was against the machinery or mechanization but it is not true he welcomed every improvement in small machines which could provide employment to millions of artisans in villages in place of mass production by big factories he advocated production by masses in their own homes and cottages that is the crux of now today's development which should happen after covid 19 and which is now promoted by our pradhan mantri ji that we should become vocal for local it should be the local economy local production system local processing system and then only we can become atmanirbhar bharat at every level whether it's a village level or town level or city level or state level or national level and the concept of mahatma gandhi for production by masses not the mass production in the mass production system what is happening presently is that all kind of raw materials are transported from across the globe to china and china has become the mass production system for all the major industries in the world they are producing the finished product from all the raw material and then it is again migrated transported from china to every mall of the world whether it is in usa or europe japan thailand india anywhere this situation should change now and this mass production should become the production by masses and then only we can realize the gram swaraj so gandhi ji was most anxious to provide full employment to every able bodied citizen of india recently iit delhi has organized diamond jubilee celebration of iit delhi and we invited the honorable vice president of india and in his inaugural address the vice president of india sri venkaiah naidu ji said categorically said that we are having dividend of the youth in the nation more than 60% population is below 35 years and this country is young we can do work other countries like usa japan china europe they are the old countries their majority of the population is above 50 so the working hand with these countries are very less whereas working hand in our country is too much we should be able to provide employment to every working willing working person that was the theme gandhi ji provocated at that time gandhi ji was most anxious to provide full employment to every able bodied citizen of india and what is happening is that more than 10 crore educated youth are without job without employment and that is creating frustration that is creating frustration among that is creating frustration among youngsters in the country and the situation should be changed and he maintained that he this objective could be achieved only by organizing village and cottage industries in the countryside in an efficient manner any economic planning which they don't utilize fully the ideal manpower in the rural areas could not be termed as sound or rational do his thought was that everybody every villager should get quality employment opportunity quality income from their work and he provocated for that therefore the areas all kind of facility should also be provided to rural areas whether it's a road connectivity or basic communities like health education connectivity internet connectivity employment opportunity and he acted upon it how he acted upon it that he was equally concerned 
about developing our villages, developing our Gram Suraj, and therefore he was not only concerned with uh, that we have to achieve independence, but he was equally concerned that with independence we should also be able to get villages, self-planned system, self-planned economy. And for that target, he formed All India Village Industry Association in 1944 to develop technologies relevant to villages, village industry and artisans for their empowerment and kept top scientists of that time, top industrialists to be in the governing body of this IWA. C.V. Raman, Jesse Bose, P.C. Ray, Nansyam Taj Birla are the few who were there in the governing body. He formed IWA. That India should develop technology which is relevant to 80% of the population at that time. Not for large industry or for urban people, but really relevant to rural artisans, rural production system, production by margin. So those kind of technology should be developed. He also set up his and stayed in Sevagram, Bartha, for and showing self land system demonstration where he lived for many years before independence. And to my surprise, when I was just going through his reading, he announced a rupees one lakh award at that time in 1945 to improve upon the Ambar Charkha, develop a new design of an efficient Ambar Charkha, which could be utilized by all the people in the country. So at that time, there were nearly 32 crore population of India. And he wanted that every should, buddy should do some work, should spin charkha, or whatever way one can work, one should work. So, if I count one lakh rupees at that time, it may be now crores of rupees. So even nobody is announcing of that kind of uh, announcement or challenge for developing technologies related to rural areas, developing technologies related to artisans developing technology related to common person. And he, he took its cognizance and announced one lakh award of developing Ambar Charka at that time. He suggested scientists to do research on rural industries and technologies, nutrition and health benefit of jaggery because Britishers were destroying jaggery production system in every village and promoting sugar mills. So he insisted that you know, scientists should work that what are the benefits of jaggery for health, for nutritional benefits. And at that time, he asked this uh, Jesse Bose, can you find, oh sorry, PC Ray, can you find the benefit of jaggery? So he said that there is no such research papers available in any journal in the world which highlights the benefits of jaggery. And comparison with jaggery and the utilization of sugar. So he persisted that now it is for Indian scientists to do research on this and publish good quality papers. So you can understand the thought, the direction which he gave to the science at that time and technology at that time. So he gave a direction of Swadeshi science. That don't think what the scientists in UK or Europe and America are doing. They will not benefit our society. They will not benefit with their work to Indians, to the villagers of this country. Therefore, our direction should be the Swadeshi science, Indian science, which is relevant to rural areas, which is relevant to artisans. And that is what the Prime Minister is propagating now. And that mantra was Atmanirbhar Bharat. And we at Unnat Bharat Abhyan is also aiming how we can achieve Atmanirbhar Bharat, how we can progress towards Atmanirbhar Bharat in coming years.
So with this background, how Unnat Bharat Abhiyan is progressing, I would just like to brief you that the, the background of Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, that why we need this kind of system, that every educational, higher educational institute in the country should adopt a cluster of five villages around them and work for their development. Then they will utilize their students, they will utilize their faculty members. So in the process, our faculty members and students will learn many things when they will go to the villages, sit in Gram Sabhas, understand the real life challenges, understand the traditional technologies, traditional wisdom, traditional learning from people, which is not there in books, which is not there in the present curriculum. So this is a paradigm shift in our academic programs and research programs of this country. I can quote one example. In IIT Delhi, we represent a center for rural development and technology. And in my center, more than 124 students are doing PhD. In the center for rural development and technology, we are the multidisciplinary research and uh, our faculty members are doing research relevant to rural technologies, rural science. When our students are doing research, generally the trend was that they generally review various international journals, see what is the research gap in these journals, and then take up, understand some problem statement, and they work upon there, and then work for three, four years, get PhD degree, publish some papers and that's all. So the whole paradigm in last four or five years after Unnath Bharat Abhyan, we have changed the perception of these students, working of these students. We make it mandatory that you have to go to villages, stay there for at least months, understand their problem, pick up some problem which is faced by people in the villages. You should take up those issues and work for, in, for your PhD work for three, four years for giving solutions of these technological issues, development issues, which you find in rural areas. And that will give you satisfaction, that will give you good quality publication, and that is relevant. So now, all over the world, all the top universities in the world, whether it's a MIT or Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard, whatever it is, they are working that how our education system is linked to rural areas. Our academic programs, our development, our systems, how are linked to the society. So everybody is looking towards societal work. And that's why Unnath Bharat Abhyan, we are propagating that all the universities, colleges should adopt a cluster of five villages around them and work for their development in collaboration with the district administration. So the objective of Unnath Bharat Abhyana is to engage the faculty and students of higher education institute in understanding rural realities, to identify and select existing innovative technologies, enable customization of technologies, or devise implementation method for innovative solutions as per the local needs. So these solutions may be of management solution, social solution, economic solution, whatever they feel they can implement innovative solutions. And to leverage the knowledge base of the institutions to devise processes for effective implementation of various government programs, government of India or state government implementing for rural development. So this is the objective of Unnath Bharat Abhyan. So in 2014, we started as a one national coordinator, one NCI, National Coordinator Institute of Unnath Bharat Abhiyan, because the concept was given by IIT Delhi and MHRD found that because this is program of IIT Delhi, so we will only facilitate, support financially, and you have to work, coordinate this program in the whole country. So we are coordinating on behalf of MHRD. There are 13 subject expert groups. And every subject expert group is coordinated by a different institution in the country. There are 45 regional coordinating institutes. And uh, regional coordinating institutes are located in 
minimum one in every state and in large states there are two three up to four regional coordinating institutes are there who are coordinating with national coordinating institute and uh, providing mentoring and guiding the participating institute of bandarwada jila if i give an example for uttar pradesh uttar pradesh has three regional coordinating institutes for western up it is iit kanpur for eastern up it is bhu iit and for central up it is dayal bag education institute agra so these three regional coordinating with the help of our nci iit delhi they are supporting advising and uh, monitoring participating institute for the implementation of unna bharat abhiyan so presently there are 2614 participating institute and they have adopted nearly 14000 villages across the country you can see the right side the map of india where regional coordinating institute and participating institutes are marked and you can see the whole country is now covered and uh, recently the honorable minister has called us and discussed that uh, where where we have reached so we said that we are working in 14000 villages so he said that do you know how many villages are there in the country he said uh, there are 6 lakh villages more than 6 lakh villages he said how many gram panchayat there are 2 lakh 50000 gram panchayat more than that do you know how many total colleges universities are there so he himself said that there are more than 45000 colleges and universities 1000 universities and 45000 colleges out of that 35000 colleges comes under ugc nearly 10000 colleges comes under aict professional colleges so all the gram panchayat 2.5 lakh gram panchayat should be connected to some higher educational institute in next 5 years so that is the challenge that is the mandate of unnat bharat abhiyan that in coming 5 years every village in the country should be connected to some higher educational institute for their development work and district administration district collectors and the implementing agency should also collaborate with the participating institute and they our students our faculty members should help in implementing developing these villages so you can just see a diagram there are 56% technical institute in the country are participating institute 44% non technical or ugc institutes are under unnat bharat abhiyan and you see there are agricultural institute you can see 34 agricultural institutes 21 all 21 iits icers iims nitr national institute of technical teachers training institutes nits national institute of technologies ems so all these higher educational institutes are part of unnat bharat abhiyan and we are working in nearly 432 districts of the country and with all 58 aspirational districts and we are also making technical technological interventions at the field level and during covid period many of our institutes more than 600 institutes have worked in their adopted villages for awareness for promotion for supplying mask sanitizers and making people aware and also help in agricultural weather forecasting and because all the participating institute and regional institutes are having whatsapp group of their villages so they are supporting these villagers in various ways and unnat bharat abhiyan is contributing in these villages very much so these are the subject expert groups and which institute is coordinating these so rural and system is coordinated by iit delhi rural crafts and artisans iit kanpur sanitation and solid waste management iit madras liquid waste management iit delhi rural infrastructure and iit delhi ethos in technical institutions iit mumbai water resource management iit kharagpur sustainable agricultural system indian agricultural research institute new delhi capacity building national institute of rural development and panchayati raj hyderabad skill development aict 
curriculum reforms, UGC, improvement in school education, IIT Delhi, others health and other school or sports, COVID-19 related IIT Delhi. So these are the subject expert groups and in every expert group, we are having a group of experts which reviews your proposal for technical interventions, customization and on their recommendations of different SEG coordinators, NCI provide the financial support for the technical interventions project. So we provide up to 1 lakh rupee support to these and these our subject expert groups are connected with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So there are 17 sustainable development goals and these sustainable development goals are how these are connected to our subject expert groups. So we have drawn a connection with all these sustainable development goals that our subject expert groups are connected to this and government of India is fulfilling the mandate of sustainable development goals through Unnar Bharat Abhiyan subject expert groups. So if we see now this is stage 2, Unnar Bharat Abhiyan 2 and very soon we are going to launch the Unnar Bharat Abhiyan 3 where all the villages in the country will be connected to our higher education institute in next five years. And uh, till Unnar Bharat Abhiyan 1, till 2016, 14 to 16, IIT Delhi was approaching across the country requesting to adopt Unnar Bharat Abhiyan to different universities and colleges and institutions and uh, we were signing MOU with those institutions for Unnar Bharat Abhiyan. But uh, that mode was changed in 2016 and now invitation mode was converted into selection through challenge mode. Anybody can apply online on our web portal anytime 24-7 it is open and every month we are having a review meeting with the MHRD secretary and there, what, whosoever is applying in that month, that is discussed and then that list is approved. That, okay, from this month onwards, these institutions are registered with Unnar Bharat Abhiyan. And then we provide support, 10,000 rupees per village, per institute. So a cluster of five villages are supported for one institute. So... 50,000 rupees per institute we are providing as an initial grant to the institute once they are selected and registered with Unnat Bharat Abhiyan through our Unnat Bharat Abhiyan portal. And uh, then if they also write a proposal, this is one page proposal we require on technical interventions in villages through subject expert groups. So online they can submit it, then subject expert coordinator review it, and then if they recommend, we just provide 1 lakh rupees per technical intervention and we do not reject any proposal. We just uh, tell our subject expert groups and the, the coordinators to, if it is not found suitable or, or able to recommend it, so they, we provide them that uh, how you can improve your proposal, how, what kind of things you should mention. So our subject expert group coordinators provide them mentorship, provide them assistance, provide them support for improving their project proposal so they are able to access this grant. So one lakh grant for technical interventions and 50,000 grant for already some technology there and they are not functioning well so their technology customization, we are having 50,000 rupees support. In addition to that, we provide to all regional coordinating institute a 10 lakh grant for the coordination of Unnagrat Abhyan activity in their region. Then MHRD through AST and UGCA two days later that higher education institute can use their own resources, corpus fund, alumni fund or whatever fund they are having with them can be utilized for Unnagrat Bharat Abhyan activities. There is no need for any permission from higher authority or state government or central government or UGC or AICT. But they can make use of their fund for Unnar Bharat Abhyan activity and for that then do not need any permission, any approval from authorities. Or your CSS 
से या और सी एस आर फंड एलमनाई फंड और स्टेट सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट फंड और उन्नत भारत अभियान तो एनी स्टूडेंट स्टडिंग इन एनी इंस्टीट्यूट कैन पार्ट ऑफ उन्नत भारत अभियान दे कैन कॉन्टेक्ट कोऑर्डिनेटर और इफ इट इज ऑलरेडी नॉट द पार्ट ऑफ उन्नत भारत अभियान इवन दे कैन कोडिन कॉन्टेक्ट अदर इंस्टीट्यूशन विच इज पार्ट ऑफ उन्नत भारत अभियान एंड दे कैन कंट्रीब्यूट इन दीज विलेजेज थ्रू वेरियस इंटर्नशिप प्रोग्राम और अदर प्रोग्राम ऑफ उन्नत भारत अभियान ऑलरेडी यू जी सी एज स्टार्टेड टू क्रेडिट कंपल्सरी कोर्स फॉर ऑल अंडर ग्रेजुएट प्रोग्राम विच इज कम्युनिटी एंगेजमेंट एंड सोशल रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी इन विच स्टूडेंट्स हैव टू गो टू विलेजेज अंडरस्टैंड देयर इश्यूज लर्न इंटरवीन समथिंग एंड मेक सम प्रैक्टिकल थिंग इन द विलेजेज थ्रू इंटरवेंशन देन ASCT is made it mandatory that there should be hundred hours rural internship program for all BTEC and uh, so I am just uh, concluding. We have started Tech for Seva program in which uh, our participating institute will be. finding problem statement and unnat bharat abhiyan institutes will provide to their technical support of those problems so it is already there in nirf unnat bharat abhiyan has been included in nirf ranking nec accreditation and teachers faculty members this is also included in their approval appraisal promotions like you are attending any conference seminar or making presentations for papers the work of unnat bharat abhiyan is now included in our promotions also for your appraisal also and at the end i would like to say that whole global paradigm across the globe is changing after corona people are migrating back to rural areas now this is time that all our institutes our youth in the country can contribute for the rural livelihood program to make our country atmanirbhar bharat so in next 5 years you will be seeing that all villages in the country will be connected to some higher education institute for their development so bevkan said education isn't only collection of information but something more meaningful education should be man making life giving and character building so with this vision i would like to thanks all of you for patient leading thank you very much thank you so much sir for a very enlightening and thought provoking talk as stated by the spirit of india lies in villages unless our villages develop and become self reliant india will not develop yours and your team's vision for transformational change in rural development in the form of uba will certainly contribute to that end thank you so much sir thank you Our third and last keynote speaker, Professor Jaya Chakraborty, ma'am, is a professor and head of the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism Department at Tejpur University. Her areas of interest are ICT for development, information and knowledge societies, sociology of communication technology and media, gender and ICT, communication for social change, children and media participation, etc. She has several research experience projects and publications in reputed journals. Today she will be sharing with us her expert opinion on appropriate technology and Gandhian philosophy for economic development. Professor Joya Chakraborty ma'am. Ma'am can you please unmute yourself? Hi oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you Angel. Uh, am I audible now? Yes ma'am you are audible. Yes. Uh His Excellency, the Governor of Assam, uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor V K Jain, uh, uh, respected panelists, uh, Professor Manjul Hazarika and Professor uh, V K Vijay, uh, thanks uh, uh, and our uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor V K Jain, uh, Professor uh, Deben Borua. Uh, and all other people who are uh, attending this uh, discussion today uh, 
thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, a human connection to communication technologies. As I'm from the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, I'm trying to talk about communication technologies, trying to drive home the point that communication technologies play a very significant role uh, for sustainable development, for furthering the goals of development, and how disparities uh, in the distribution of this technology hampers the idea of humane development, which was central to the idea of development perceived by Mahatma Gandhi. So I'm connecting uh, Mahatma Gandhi's ideologies on development to how communication technologies probably should be shaped today to address and fit uh, to his ideologies of development. Uh, I have, uh, I'll go forward with a small presentation. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, so I say communication technology for humane development. I'm here to talk about Gandhian philosophy in connection with evolution of communication technology and humane development. As I try to establish this connection, I also contend that it is essential not to lose sight of this connection if we are to ensure the establishment of Gandhi's version of Ram Rajya. And as uh, the previous speakers have already highlighted that the Ram Rajya has nothing to do with religion. It is nothing but a society based on truth and non-violence. It is a perfect democracy, free of all sorts of inequalities based on possession or non-possession of assets color, creed, race, or sex. Here the villages are prosperous and self-contained, and the state belongs to people who enjoy freedom of speech and press. This is how Gandhiji explained his def definition of Ram Rajya in an article dated 1st June 1947 in the Harijan. I'll come back to discussing uh, Gandhi's version of development in detail later. Now, if this was Gandhi's vision for an ideal nation, then how far or how close are we in achieving it today? To understand this, we have to juxtapose his notion of development with that of the International Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. That again has been discussed uh, in detail. And we understand that the sustainable development goals were adopted to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. The goals recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth. All while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. Closely connected to this idea of SDG is the Human Development Index. And again, I will not uh, talk about it uh, uh, in detail. We understand uh, that the Human Development Index for the first time created a shift from the focus on economic development to human-centered development where it emphasized that people are the real wealth of a nation. There are uh, close connections uh, between uh, interconnections between SDGs and the Human Development Index. So uh, where many of the SDGs, uh, we can understand the achievement of the SDGs by looking into the HDI. 
So uh, this in, again, I'll not go into uh, in detail because these points have been discussed by many of the previous uh, scholars. Uh, but uh, I'm discussing this to drive home the point that for development to be humane, it has to focus on human wealth, equality, and environmental protection, which are now at the center of all discourses on development. So both the national as well as international agenda talk about a human-centered approach to development. Uh, so uh, in order to measure this, we, all, we have also had the uh, SDG India Index, uh, where uh, we have looked at uh, the Niti Aayog had evaluated the level of achievement of India with regard to the sustainable uh, development goals as far as uh, the different states of India are concerned. And uh, uh, we are uh, some, there are multiple uh, 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 categories in which the different states of India were uh, uh, divided in order to measure that how much we have achieved. So there were different categories which were there, uh, like achiever, front runner, performer, and aspirant. And uh, we see that the overall rank of India was somewhere around uh, 57. Uh, and there were certain good performing states and certain states which were not performing very well as far as the SDG India Index uh, is there. So there, there is uh, disparities in terms of achievement. I believe uh, uh, I'm just trying to highlight this point that development indices, there are disparities uh, in India with regard to the development indices and the achievement of those development indices. Now, where does communication fit into this scheme? And what has advances in communication technology got to do with this? Uh, Success in achieving the global agenda for democratic governance and human development is dependent largely to the extent to which national planning processes are informed by all sections of society, rich and poor, urban and rural, working or unemployed, literate or non-literate alike. Everybody has to inform the national policy. So access to clear, reliable and appropriate information is necessary for citizens to make informed decisions and to influence policy processes that affect their lives. That is the significance of communication. So communication for development processes can therefore be seen as essential for effective participation and central to enhancing human development. It is through effective communication that governments are able to convince the citizenry about the appropriateness of its policies for social change and ensure their inclusion through meaningful participation. Again, it is communication that enables societies and communities to realize their social and cultural capital for meaningful engagement within the knowledge society. So we understand that there are internal resources which are uh, uh, coined in terms of the social and cultural capital of a particular society or a particular community. And it's very important that people realize the value of that. And there is a connection between these local perspectives, the local capital, the local assets and the national policy. We have constantly been discussing about how development now needs to have a local focus it needs to have it needs to have a dimension of local where we go from local to the global and in doing so a very important factor is played by the information and communication technologies so this uh, communication and development dialectic has been revolutionized with the advent of new age communication technologies the rapid spread of information and communication technologies in recent years is transforming how people communicate and exchange information with each other and have a major factor in driving competitiveness, economic growth and social development. In the last decade, ICTs, particularly mobile phones, have also opened up new channels for the free flow of ideas and opinions, thereby promoting democracy and human rights. Inclusion and exclusion from this digital network has come to define the potential or lack thereof 
to leapfrog into modern era for governments and citizens. So it's very important that we understand that who has access to these digital technologies because that is going to determine an individual's capacity to realize the potential of full social development or social change. However, not all sections of society are able to take advantage of these opportunities. While the expansion of ICTs open up many opportunities for public participation, they can also serve to widen the gap between those with access and the skills to use new technologies and those without. So, we are staring at a situation where there are existing inequalities within the society and we have ICTs which provide us with an opportunity to, uh, uh, to achieve the development goals further. Now, these existing disparities in the, in the society, when they affect the disparity in access to ICTs, they kind of multiply the inabilities that people have, the disadvantages that people have. The disadvantages get multiplied because of the inability to access and use ICTs in an effective manner. However, the situation gets more complicated when it is realized that digital technologies uh, or the digital divide is not just an access inequality. It is not just about who has access to a computer on an internet connection, but it is rather a multi-dimensional phenomenon with multiple gaps rolled into one, like gender divide, language divide, content divide, and many more. Investigations revealed that previous social inequalities influence the rise and persistence of digital inequalities. This led to the development of the concept of digital capital. Digital capital is a new idea in addition to the concepts of social, political, cultural, personal, and economic capital. It insists on an interplay between digital capital and the other forms of capital to enable individuals to transform the digital resources into social resources and to exploit the full advantages offered by the internet. Digital capital is the accumulation of internalized ability and aptitude or digital competencies and externalized resources like digital technology. To clarify, this means that digital capital creates a bridge between the online and offline mode of opportunities for individuals. It allows individuals to build online competencies based on their other capitals, social, cultural, political, etc. These online competencies then in turn again translate into offline externally observable social resources. So if I have to explain it, then you, we have certain cultural capital. If I take the uh, case of Assam, like the textile uh, of Assam, uh, the tea of Assam. So there are certain values or capital which is associated to all of these. And when I am able to connect this onto a digital opportunity and then derive offline opportunities, that means it translates into economic grain, recognition, and other assets for me in the offline mode, that is how I'm going to leverage the advantage of the digital capital. This interplay between the other capitals which are there in an individual and the digital resources and the technology, that is the idea of digital capital. Excuse yes. me, ma'am. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we are running short of time. So sorry. Yes, I, I, I understand that. Uh, I'll take another uh, five minutes just to establish the connection. All right, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll quickly say that if this is the potential, now let us look at the inequalities which are there in terms of the uh, access and usage of internet resources and digital technologies in India. I will not go through the statistics. They are there. Uh, and I believe many of us have been uh, discussing and knowing about it uh, uh, of late. Uh, so in this context, I have to say that we are also talking in the present context of artificial intelligence in all spheres of life. And we are also looking at these and staring at these disparities and where we have uh, shifted the focus 
to reviving our villages, to reviving our rural economies. And we have been hearing about the Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, the aspirational districts, uh, uh, all of that. And we are also talking about artificial intelligence. So this is a dichotomy that India is living in right now. So let me now return to Gandhiji's vision for development. Mahatma Gandhi had a very distinctive vision for national development and his ideologies are well always evolutionary in nature. His idea of Satyagraha, which is based on truth, non-violence and passive resistance, is strongly based on attaining self-consciousness. Gandhi's concrete understanding of mass consciousness was entirely related to his objective of social change because without any attempt to attain mass empowerment would be impossible. Mass consciousness, according to him, was tantamount to soul force or truth force. He was a firm believer in the capacity of man to struggle and survive all hardships. Now, we have been hearing about this, that uh, yes, Gandhi was uh, against Western machinery-based industrialization. He was not against mechanization per se, but... Uh, he was more against the penetration of capitalism, the values of capitalism which came along with the idea of mechanization and uh, industrialization. He critiqued the self-righteous nature of the westernized model of modern civilization as according to him, it lacked the capacity for self-introspection and was morally reckless. Gandhi was skeptical to technological growth. His emphasis on revival of the khattar and the spinning wheel is a specific case in point. By placing Khadr as the uniform of the Indian patriot and by promoting spinning the charkha, Gandhi not only created a very powerful symbolism for nationalistic emancipation, but also emphasized the importance of the Indian craftsman. He wanted it to lead the way to other village industries and home crafts and retract all machinery, which according to him were merely violence in motion. Gandhi's constructive program was threefold, economic in Khattar, social in the removal of untouchability, and moral in the abolition of drinking or alcoholism. Uh, so he, he was also a person who talked about the integrative idea of development, where development had to be in consonance with uh, the environment, with the culture. Uh, he was integrative of the idea of the village. He was a firm believer also in the supremacy of the mother tongue. As a mass communicator, he understood people's intimate attachment to their own language. He said that the national language of India must develop into a rich and powerful instrument capable of expressing the whole gamut of human thought and feelings. He himself on many occasions had appropriated various English or other regional language words to suit the understanding of his audience. Thus, in equating Gandhi's vision of social change with that of the current discourses of development, we find how he was far ahead of his times in articulating the importance of human agency and participation as central to the process of national progress. He strongly believed in realizing the social, cultural, personal, and economic capital of the people of India living in its villages as the most powerful agency to propel the process of national development. Gandhi was strongly against all inequality. He recognized poverty as a threat to peace. Hence, if we are to uphold his, his ideal of non-violence, then poverty must be eradicated in all its forms in health, education, technological access, and the like. So, Today, when we deliberate on eradication of poverty, empowerment, and peace, Gandhian philosophy still remains relevant and can provide us with the blueprint and pathway to attain these goals. This will require us to make all our institutions and policies inclusive and devoid of perpetuating the discrimination in any form. Communication technologies as an agency of social change must become communitary by embracing processes of community informatics, whereby technologies become more socially responsive and get designed within the cultural, economic, and social context of the intended user community. 
Gandhi was metaphorical in many of his deliberations. He expected his writings and messages to be understood in its context. He provided powerful symbolic messages through his life and living. As he popularly said, my life is my message. Even today, we have not been able to comprehend the entirety of his uh, philosophical musings, but still Gandhi has evolved to provide powerful symbolism, which has been decrypted into various development programs of our country, like the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, and we have recently right now been hearing about Unnat Bharat Abhiyan. So here's hoping that rather than the disbelief that such a person ever, ever walked uh, upon this earth, let Gandhi inspire generations to come and make generations strive and achieve <clears throat> the morals and the values and the philosophies that Gandhi stood for throughout his life. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We are very sorry for having to cut short such an interesting session. Thank you so much for highlighting on the communication technology and Gandhian philosophy for humane development. We are certain that the participants have benefited from your enlightening talk. I will now hand over the platform to Professor Devendra Borwa, sir, to moderate the question, answer, and discussion session. Sir? Yeah, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yeah, uh, one question here from Eda Kinta. The question is that the relationship between MSME and Gram Saraj. Uh, I request uh, one of the research persons, probably DK Bija sir, to what is the, how the MSME thinks and then Gram Saraj could be taken care of. Very swiftly, maybe. Uh, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So, micro, medium, and small industries are also part of the cottage and and old household industry. And also the Khadi and Village Industry Commission propagated by Mahatma Gandhi and then in the whole country it is going on, is also part of MSME. So, Gram Suraj was that how we can have industries which is relevant to artisans, which is relevant to the primary production system, processing of all those materials and finally product can be utilized at the local level. So production system and utilization level mainly remains local and it improves the local economy. That is the theme of Gram Suraj and our mainly the micro small enterprises are also part of that category. Thank you very much. Another observation from Ritu Bhatia from Manipur. The observation is uh, that in the Bharat is a good concept, but uh, we should also see the, its effectiveness, performance in hilly and remote areas. I hope uh, our national coordinator will look into it and uh, how the whole there is a problem of connectivity and other issues, particularly I think uh, the, the Dabis referring to the northeastern region. Uh, I think in future endeavors, in policy, this will be taken care of. So we are now having more focus towards the Northeast and the aspirational districts in Urnanvata Bihan. So it will be now focused approach for Northeast and the aspirational districts. Thank you. Uh, just another query by uh, Dr. Manjul Hadarika uh, regarding this planning of using this GIS and other technology. Do you see the prospects of micro level planning integrating with this our inner Bharata vision? Whatever the information is not known, because we have a provision and process also collecting the data to housing survey, detailed exchange of data. Then some of the planning, you said that we could do it before the exhibition, before the completion of the crop. So this your uh, technology, I think, can it be useful or integrated to this or easier problem? Very quickly, you can respond, please. Yeah, yeah, we would like to utilize all those facilities and technology which are available to us for improving the mechanism of Unnat Bharat Abhyan. We would love to do that. Thank you. Uh, please quickly, very quickly, respond. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, uh, you are asking about how this space tech and this modern technology can be 
integrated with the field or data is, is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, uh, uh, yes, it is very much possible because this technology has gone to a very, uh, I mean, uh, to a level where your field, uh, field people can be connected directly. To the, to the this kind of technology using 4G or 5G. So nowadays, any platform you talk about, um, uh, you can uh, you can uh, have a mobile application. You go to the field. You don't have to f uh, carry out a questionnaire. Traditionally, we go for survey and data collection. In the mobile phone, you have the all field. You fill it up. Then then you take a photograph of the area. You push your bottom. Immediately, uh, that photograph and location, everything will come into the map where it should be, and you can you can uh, take in certain interval and you can see the progress uh, of, of the things also. I think this is uh, becoming very very easy, and I think uh, uh, the new project uh, Taipei University has got regarding this kind of resource collection will be uh, implementing this kind of uh, mobile application to connect to the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe in the context of uh, Madam Jaya Sakurabati's concept, what he is saying, it has to be integrated at least to these five villages I mentioned, where we have around 13,000 population and remote areas are also they are inaccessible. They are, they are isolated deep. Uh, you are, I think we should take care. Thank you very much. There are other queries, and that will be taken care individually due to start of time. I request all the participants to uh, uh, yeah, take their feedback form. There is an uh, open in the questions, queries could be put up there to arrange to connect our research questions and to give your answers or uh, replies to you directly. Uh, and then there is a link or feedback form. Once you have that, that will be uh, available for 24 hours. Within the 24 hours, you use the feedback form link. All the uh, all team participants, agents, uh, certificate will be generated. And then your specific queries, if any, will take care to answer. So, our email as we have uh, already we have connected collected your email thank you very much this is with this this moderation session is over i hand over this mic to my uh dr angel please thank you so much professor borwa all the resource persons and thank you mr abhijit for sharing the questions in the chat box may i now request dr birin das sir registrar of case for university for delivering the vote of thanks <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, His Excellency, the Honorable Governor of Assam and the Chancellor of the University, Professor Jagdish Mukhi, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, and other dignitaries online on the international webinar, the esteemed participants and the members of the organizing committee. It's my pleasure to propose vote of thanks on behalf of the University and on my own behalf. The University is very much grateful to His Excellency, the Honorable Governor of Assam and the Chancellor of the University, Professor Jagdish Mukhi, for inaugurating the Urbina, accepting our invitation to be the chief guest, sparing his valuable time out of his busy schedule. Sir, your encouraging and in-depth inaugural speech has made the objects of this webinar more meaningful. The University is always blessed by your guidance and hope that the University will march further under your chancellorship. We are thankful to Professor T.K. Join, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University, that he spared his valuable time to deliver the welcome address to all the dignitaries and the esteemed participants with a brief note on the subject of the webinar. It was his idea that a webinar on this area can be considered befitting the celebration of 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. We are very grateful to Professor V.K. Vijay, a professor of IIT Delhi and the national coordinator of Unnathart Abhijan, who agreed to be a keynote speaker with a short notice and to deliver on Unnathart Abhijan for uh, fulfilling Gandhi's dream of rural development. We hope your role will make Unnathbharat Obijan a success in the country to its mandate. We also offer vote of thanks to Professor Manjul Kumar Hazarika, the director GIC at Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, for being agreed to act as a keynote speaker who deliberated on sustainable technology and Gandhian perspective of rural development. We hope 
academic collaboration between Tejpur University and Asian Institute of Technology will go a long way for mutual academic benefits with your cooperation. We are also thankful to Professor Jaya Sakraborty, Professor and Head Department of Mass Comm and Journalism of Tejpur University for deliberating on communication technology and Gandhian philosophy for human development as one of the keynote speaker. We are grateful to GIC, Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, and National Lunar Bharat Avijan for collaborating with the Esprimity for organizing this webinar. We offer our sincere thanks to all the participants of the webinar for their partial but active participation. We hope the participants will be able to take some, take home some valuable inputs on the sustainable technologies and rural development from Gandhian perspective. We also thank all the viewers of the webinar. At the end, I offer my sincere thanks to Professor D.C. Borwa, the Tejpur University Coordinator of Unnat Bharat Abhijan and his team, including the technical and media staff for successfully organizing the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for delivering the vote of thanks. Uh, there's an announcement on behalf of the organizing team. The feedback and the e-certificate link will be shared with all the participants after the webinar in the Facebook, Google Meet, chat, and YouTube. Uh, the link will expire after 24 hours, so I request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form and generate the e-certificate link. Before we declare the end of today's program, may I request one and all to kindly stand for and in honor of the National Anthem. Jana gana mana adhinayak jayahi Bharat bhatya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Ravira Uttana Banga Vindya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladhita Ganga Tabashubhana me jage, Tabashubha ashisha maage, Gahe tabajaya gatha, Janagana mangala dayak jaya he, Bharat bhagya vidhata, Jaya he, Jaya he, Jaya he. Jaya 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 He. Thank you so much. With this, we come to the end of today's program. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We can leave now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Namaskar. Namaskar to everyone here. Ha 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 ha.